Thank you very much. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, PCFA, for this uh, important invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today sharing some of our research findings. I'm going to be trying to summarize 10 years of research in 15 slides. Well, I think it's important to understand that traditionally clinicians would advise cancer patients to completely rest and avoid physical activity given the difficulties of undergoing therapy, chemotherapy, radiation surgery, or hormone, hormone therapy. Now, a number of research studies have been conducted in the past 20 years, in particular in the past 10 years, that have completely challenged these old recommendations. And now we have the American Cancer Society and American College of Sports Medicine actually recommending patients and survivors to be physically active. So if we go back until 2004, this is a review research that we had in JCO, only 26 studies were undertaken in this particular area of exercise and cancer. And this is nearly 10 years ago. The large majority of these studies were in the area of breast cancer using aerobic exercise. So there's differences in terms of exercise modalities. Aerobics more like walking, swimming, and cycling. And at the time, the literature was indicating that exercise would be possible, first of all, would be well tolerated by patients, it would be safe to do, uh, it would very likely to reduce fatigue, improve muscle function and, 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 and quality, uh, improve aerobic capacity or cardiorespiratory fitness, improve and maintain body composition, and also improve quality of life. What is also interesting, particularly in the area of prostate cancer, that nothing at the time really was really done in the area of exercise in prostate cancer, apart from one Canadian study from a colleague called Ryan Siegel. And men with prostate cancer, at, su at some stage they might receive a particular type of drug called ADT or hormone therapy. Uh, it's, it's an interesting drug that eliminates testosterone production with different types of medications. And if you think about reducing testosterone to castrate levels, it leads to a number of issues and toxicities. And we'll talk about some of these issues. Why men are being prescribed ADT? A number of important clinical studies in combination with radiation therapy has shown that improves survival, in particular in high-risk prostate cancer. So there's an, an increased use of ADT or hormone therapy in the management of prostate cancer. However, ADT leads to a number of significant toxicities and adverse effects. This is just a, a kind of a brief summary of some of the consequences of this particular type of therapy. And as I said, it's important for survival. However, it leads to reduction in physical capacity, reduction in muscle strength, muscle loss, cardiovascular morbidity, in other words, and increased risk factors of developing cardiovascular disease, sexual dysfunction by reducing testosterone to zero levels, osteoporosis and skeletal fractures, metabolic syndrome, which is a combination of risk factors to develop diabetes, fatigue, and poor balance, which is a problem because they already have low bone mass, low muscle strength. They're more susceptible to have a fall and subsequently a fracture. And quantifying some of those toxicities and adverse effects from ADT, this is some of research data that we've published previously uh, from a Western Australian cohort. Here we're looking at changes of around 2.3 kilograms of body fat only in nine months of therapy. Here we had a, a cohort of patients that started therapy for nine months and we followed them for two more years. And at the same time, these guys are actually losing around 1.5 kilogram of muscle. And we're not just talking about body weight, we're talking about muscle measured by dual energy X-ray absometry DEXA. So major changes occurring in body composition, gaining a lot of fat in a very short term period of time and also losing a lot of muscle. And if you think that these men are already 65 years of age or even older, this has major consequences in terms of ability that things that they can do during the day. And what's also very important, if you look at after the therapy phase, they don't recover, they don't come back to baseline levels. So certainly, this survivorship phase here for men with prostate cancer, activities that can actually counteract and reduce these types of toxicities are very important. And we've published the first study, this was back in 2006, trying to investigate the potential role of resistance training, which is lifting weights, as Trish sort of mentioned before. This was published in the Journal of the American College of Sports Medicine. And we're trying to investigate that men without testosterone receiving therapy for prostate cancer were able first to safely undertake resistance training programs, and second, if, if the program was actually effective. And what we can see here in intervals of 10 weeks, that men 
responsively to the exercise programs. And this is just showing some examples of the chest press and seated row exercise, improving their muscle strength gradually throughout the exercise program without any adverse effects. What's also very important here, they're improving muscle strength, so what? Well, they're improving muscle strength, but these changes in muscle strength are translated in improvements in function. So the ability to chair rise, stair climbing, long walk corridor, uh, we're using a 400 meter walking test, and gait speed is also improved. So we're translating changes in muscle strength to physical function. We had a second study, this was uh, more recently published in JCO, that we thought about combining the different exercise modalities, which should be really the best practice in terms of exercise prescription. Here we're combining resistance training with aerobic training, trying to address issues in terms of quality of life and fatigue, and the muscle loss that we've shown, 1.5 kilos only in nine months of therapy, which is a very significant um, uh, and clinical meaningful deterioration in the musculoskeletal system. So what we had here, we had a group doing exercise, combining the two modalities, and we had a group doing no exercise. And this is just a very brief summary from this work. And what we can see that lean mass or muscle, it's actually improved exercise greater than controls by one kilo. So irrespectively of the lack of testosterone in their system, they are still responsive, responsive and they can actually increase muscle with this particular modality of ex exercise training. They also improved muscle strength, aerobic capacity by reducing the time to perform on specific tasks. And this is quite important because it's aerobic capacity is the most important predictor of cardiovascular uh, mobility and mortality. So here we're in a way reducing the potential risk of cardiovascular disease, which is critical for men with prostate cancer. What is also very important is that these men, what they perceived in terms of the general health, vitality and fatigue, were also improved at clinical significant levels. So they are feeling better, they are feeling healthier, with no change in PSA and testosterone in terms of clinical data, which is also important, because exercising healthy older men is likely to increase testosterone acutely, and it doesn't happen in this group of men because they don't have testosterone to respond. What is also very interesting, this is a work that we had in the Journal of Urology, we're trying to understand, because there are no differences in terms of loss of body fat and visceral fat with this particular JCO trial, why this is, is, this is actually taking place. And we, we thought that the timing of the exercise or the therapy in terms of ADT, short term or acute and chronic ADT, would probably be making uh, an important impact in how men can actually respond to exercise. So if you're in a short term, therapy or you're initiating therapy, irrespectively if you're exercising, you're still gaining body fat. And however, if you're more long-term ADT or hormone therapy after one, two years, there's a kind of a decline in body fat. There, there seems to be a little bit more responsive. The, the system is likely to be a little bit more stable. So this is an interesting aspect in terms of when you're prescribing exercise programs for these patients. You're, it, it, it's important to, for their expectations to understand that depending on the time of therapy, there are likely to be differences responses in the exercise. This is a very interesting work. This is uh, some of the subsequent data from our JCO paper published by uh, one of our senior research fellows, Dr. Prue Cormie. This is the June issue of Prostate Cancer and Prostatic Diseases just published. And it's interesting that sexual dysfunction is one of the most bothering uh, adverse effects across prostate cancer therapy and certainly affects men's quality of life and their partners quite significantly. And what we thought about doing with this study, it's investigating the role of exercise in maintaining sexual activity in men receiving androgen deprivation therapy for prostate cancer. And what we can see here, the exercise group, first, after baseline in 12 weeks, they're sort of maintaining their activity in terms of sexual activity, and the control usual care group has a big drop. So exercise, in a way, sort of preserving sexual activity in these men. We don't understand the mechanisms yet, and this study wasn't designed to determine the mechanisms, but it's interesting, the first data in the literature suggesting that exercise also play a role in sexual functioning. And the clinicians, they came back to us, oh, but we want to know what's happening with libido, uh, if they're losing their interest in sex or they have greater interest in sex. So we also look at this particular type of uh, 
uh, instrument. Any interesting sex exercise sort of slightly improved, although it wasn't statistically significant with the controls. What's also very interesting that major interesting sex was preserved in 20% of the sample. However, the guys undergoing, not undergoing the exercise, the control group, had a completely loss in sex. Libido went completely down, down the hill. So, an interesting early research data suggests this is the first time this is published in the literature that exercise, resistance training, aerobic training might, in a way, preserve sexual function in men with prostate cancer. Another interesting trial, our very close collaborator, Professor Robert Newts, is a multi-site study that we're running uh, in Australia, in Queensland, and also in Western Australia, trying to determine specifics of exercise modalities. Exercise is not just walking around the block. There's a range of different types of modalities, and you have to be specific, probably like the target therapy for uh, pharmaceutical interventions. And this is a, probably a very interesting example. We had men with prostate cancer doing resistance training and also impact loading activity that we know from the literature of postmenopausal women, it's the best exercise modality because of the mechanical loading to stimulate bone preservation. And what we did here, we had men on ADT, separated in three groups. We had 160 men uh, in this particular trial. And what's very interesting is that the usual care drop in bone, and this is expected, and it's actually a quite severe loss of bone around 4%, 3% in this study, uh, up to six months in their lumbar spine due to ADT. Now, the resistance training cardiovascular group, we're sort of expecting the resistance training by itself would, in a way, preserve bone in this setting, very catabolic setting of ADT. It didn't happen. This group was also losing bone. The only group that actually was able to preserve bone was the impact loading group and the resistance training group. So different exercise modalities are likely to make different adaptations in the musculoskeletal system. And it's important to highlight, of course, bisphosphonate was an exclusion criteria for this study or bone medication. So this is really f a word first showing that exercise can arrest the loss of bone from ADT when it's appropriately prescribed. And it's actually a pleasure to be presenting this work. This is uh, uh, an exercise program from the Raider study, early funded by PCFA back in 2008. This is a very large medication study. Uh, in Australia and in New Zealand, there's 23 hospitals uh, enrolling patients for this trial. And the idea of this trial is to look at the timing of androgen deprivation therapy and radiation in terms of survival outcome. Now, these men in this particular study were having issues with metabolic complication and cardiovascular disease. And we thought about trying to incorporate an exercise program or study within the radar study. So this is an exercise trial that we had two arms, and there's a number of new features in this particular study. The first one, we had long-term cancer survivors. They're more than five years post-diagnosis. They're older cohort of men, 71 or plus. Other studies all much younger. A long-term intervention, this is a 12-month intervention study. We understand that at 12 weeks, two months, three months works. What about the long-term effects of exercise? Now, what we had here, we had two study arms. One group received six months supervised exercise by an exercise physiologist, and also a home program for the following six months, 12-week total. The other group, they were told just to do physical activity. Just do physical activity. We'll give you a booklet, uh, and we also give you a pedometer. So what's the actual outcome 12 months later? And this works now currently in re reviewing JCO. We're really hoping to get this through. Uh, and it's titled the multi-center year-long RCT for patients from the Trog Radar study. So what we found then, six months of supervised exercise training, this is a very brief summary of some of the results, led to improvements in cardiorespiratory capacity, very important, a very important predictor of cardiovascular disease, lower body physical functioning, uh, self-reported physical function, they think they are doing much better, which is very important. And I put this one here because of Suzanne, mental health uh, also improved with this study. Uh, we had some previous discussion previously when we were actually drafting this manuscript. And also HDL cholesterol, which is, a new, which is the good cholesterol, also going up. Again, a, a mark of cardiovascular disease. Appendicular skeletal muscle, just muscle tissue, also going up, measured by DEXA. This is all compared to the standard public health recommendations of physical activity. In other words, trying to make it very simple, if you give an exercise program supervised by a credit exercise physiologist up to 12 months, you're doing way better than just telling patients to be physically active. You should be doing something. They're not doing anything, basically. So, and what's very also very important, those benefits are all maintained six months later, as I said, 12 months following the program. 
This is a, an interesting area. This is also funded by PCFA. Uh, traditionally, patients have been completely excluded from clinical trials and even exercise community-based programs if they had bone metastatic disease. And naturally, some patients will develop bone mets at some stage. And our clinicians, a number of discussions that we have, this is with medical radiation oncologists and nuclear physicians, the imaging physicians, are like, no, no, we need to do something about this. We can't exclude these patients because they're in a condition that if they stop doing what they normally do, uh, even if we don't ask them to go for a walk, they are likely to deteriorate very quickly. So what we did then, this is a, a modular program of resistance training that we developed and we're testing at the moment. And so the data is looking very, very promising. Depending on the lesion of the bone mats, we're actually trying to target different areas so we don't, we don't induce compression forces in that specific area. And of course, the, the idea is to try to delay fraction, delay uh, skeletal fractures and improve function in these patients. So this is some very interesting and new data that we'll be generating, and hopefully in the next year or two we're going to have some work done and published in this particular area. In summary, this is the recommendation by the American Cancer Society. We had the opportunity to be part of this panel. It was, was recently endorsed by the American Cancer Society last year in a very important document published. We're summarizing 12 RCTs, including patients on ADT and radiation. And here we're talking about level of evidence. In lay terms, if you go with level of evidence A, you have better quality studies supporting that particular outcome. Level B is still good quality of evidence, and as you drop to C and D, you have very or lack of studies or not quite strong suggestions in terms of uh, the scientific evidence to date. What we can see for prostate cancer, exercise is safe. After 10 years of research data, patients should be doing physical activity, is safe. It leads to improvements in cardio respiratory fitness, we can say this with confidence, muscle strength and fatigue, critical issues through the survivorship phase for men with prostate cancer. Also good evidence about body composition and size, quality of life and physical functioning. What we're still investigating at the moment, and certainly there's a number of research gaps in this particular area, we don't have data quite in terms of toxicity of sexual function, although we're providing the first evidence that exercise can potentially improve. Issues around incontinence is not quite clear. Bone health balance implementation of exercise programs with patients with advanced disease. And we also providing some early data of long-term benefits of exercise. And what's also very critical for the future is looking at the specific disease, specific endpoints. I think there was some earlier today, there's one very important epidemiological study from the health professional study, health, men's, prof, men's health professional study in the U.S., suggesting that men that are undergoing vigorous physical activity are less likely to die from prostate cancer. Those are with prostate cancer. And this, the, the actual relative risk ratio is very, very high. So we're looking at 50% protection. So anyway, certainly this has to be examined in clinical trials, in RCTs, to provide the best level of evidence. Certainly like to acknowledge this research team. We've been working together for 10 years. It's a mix, and we're talking about collaboration earlier today. Medical oncologists, radiations, urologists, exercise scientists, and, and clinical psychologists. Uh, acknowledge the funding from PCFA that led to subsequent funding with NHMRC and Cancer in Australia. Thank you very much. Very happy to ask any questions. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Daniel. Um, just quickly for another 20 seconds, just chat amongst yourselves about what question you'd like to ask. Oh, we don't even need to do it. Here we go. Um, Daniel, we're recording. Can you repeat the question so on film it makes sense? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Uh, two parts of the question. First was, again, the uh, diet and nutrition taken into account when the study was done. Uh, and secondly, were the partners, as far as sexual functions go, were their partners interview interviewed? Because there's a lot of literature out there showing that if the partner of the man is not interested in sexual activity, it really puts a, a kibosh on the whole thing anyway. Yeah, so in terms of uh, diet advice, with, with these studies, we monitor their diet. We don't tell them to change their diet. And we, ma we manage and we monitor this with different instruments. So, and they normally don't, don't change their diet throughout the study. Uh, but certainly in the future, I think the combination of uh, lifestyle, exercise, interventions with diet, it's certainly a, a, probably a, a very interesting area to explore, particularly in the area of cardiovascular disease and obesity and so on. Now, in terms of the early data that we have for sexual dysfunction, now we didn't we didn't have an interaction with the partners. I think this was raised before. Partners are actually critical in getting these guys through the door. Whenever they come in, it's uh, it's fantastic because they don't want to come back. And when we finish these studies, they just don't want to leave. They want to keep going. 
So, uh, but we, we haven't monitored this particular aspect in this trial, but certainly something that we can explore in the future. Great, thanks. Uh, oh, I'll go here and then I'll, I'll come down to Trish. My, my question relates to exercise and the risk of recurring cancer. Mm -hmm. Has there been any research done whereby exercise has an impact of reducing the risk of cancer recurring? Well, not recurrency, but prostate cancer specific death. And this is from this very large epidemiological study, 20 years of date, I think 60 plus thousand patients that were followed for 20 years. Patients that were doing more than seven hours of vigorous activity per week had a 60% reduction of prostate cancer specific mortality. And they also had overall mortality of death from any cause by 50%. Now, and the mechanisms are not quite clear, but in terms of recurrence, I mean, we believe in the mechanistic studies, they're not there yet. Uh, there's something to do that exercise and physical activity, certainly, you know, apart from reducing toxicities and improving quality of life, certainly has a, 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 a potential effect in terms of uh, recurrence. But we don't have clear data at this stage. Great, thanks. Um, Trish. Thanks, Daniel. That was a great presentation. Um, I've got a question about the 12-month study that, you've, um, that you're looking at. In terms of uh, recruitment, how easy or difficult was it to recruit um, men into a 12-month study of exercise? Oh, certainly difficult. Uh, particular, these men, uh, I think with, with, the, this, with this particular study, then the most issue, that, the biggest issue that we had, they were already cancer survivors up to five years post-diagnosis. They lost that teachable moment. When you have a diagnosis, you want to change your lifestyle, you want to be healthier. So this was actually one of the critical issues that we had with this particular study, but we still were able to enroll over 100 patients in this trial. And we are also limit to recruit patients only from the regular study. So we had a pool of 1,000 patients in Australia and in New Zealand. But at the end, I mean, we were able to recruit patients and the study was successfully done. However, major support from clinicians. And in terms of running clinical trials, you've got to have the clinician referring the patient to the study. Otherwise, it's probably impossible to run the trials. Great. And we've got final one just up here. Um, thanks very much. Um, question in relation to general physical fitness mm. uh, of these men that have gone through these different trials. Have you managed to measure what their level of fitness was like prior to being diagnosed compared to the general population uh, to see if there's any variance there in men being diagnosed? We all know since we've been young, we should yeah. do lots of exercise. Now, is there a measure there that can actually um, prove that men with prostate cancer either have a general lower level of exercise than the general population. Uh, yeah, Peter, I think you're referring to levels of physical activity overall. Yeah, the participation in, uh, the data is a bit confusing. We have some interesting new data coming from um, some of the work from Queensland. Uh, yeah, suggesting that these men, I mean, 40, around 35, and depending on what you go in terms of your reference, 35 to 45 percent of these men are in a way meeting guidelines of physical activity, which it is trying to accumulate 150 minutes per week of activity. Now, new position statements from the American Cancer Society is also recommending, particularly this group of men, to also undertake resistance training twice a week. If you add this into the actual component of exercise prescription, I would suspect, and there's no data yet we're about to publish, this will be very low. Uh, there will be very low, probably 5% of men with prostate cancer are actually meeting these guidelines. I've got time for one quick... OK, Alison, you get it. I just wanted to make a comment in terms of ovarian cancer that at the ANSGOG meeting in March of this year, ANSGOG, the Australian New Zealand Gynae Oncology Group meeting, there was a new trial concept that was discussed, which was an exercise trial for ovarian cancer and they've done some earlier phase trials that have shown um, similar kinds of results in ovarian cancer and actually even women during treatment. So during chemotherapy treatment might defy all um, sense and sensibility but during um, active chemotherapy treatment that women were showing um, significant benefits in terms of their capacity to tolerate the treatment, their capacity in terms of fatigue, a range of things, and then looking at a phase three trial in terms of actually looking at those outcomes. So some exciting things in exercise and ovarian too. Thanks. Um, that sort of calls us time, but Daniel, thank you so very much. Would you please thank uh, Daniel?